No, DECA. In this case, D-E-C-A. Uh, these are not the prefixes from our King Henry Crossic. These are 10 Greek prefixes we will need to know later in this chapter in order to name covalent compounds. Uh, what's the prefix for us? Eight. Easy one to remember. Octa, how about two? Connor? Die. Die. Uh, the prefix for seven is a weird one. Don't use a lot, right? Hepta. Now, those of you who taking Spanish, please be very careful because I will eventually show these will show up on a quiz or a test and somebody will say septa. And I'm not sure if that comes from the Latin or from the French or from the Spanish, but it's hepta, H E P T A for seven. And nine is nona. Okay, who's got the one? Okay, four is a frequently missed one. It must be a prefix of coda. Tetra, tetra, like a tetrahedron, okay? And again, some people want to stick a quad in there, like a quadrilateral. I know quad means four as well, but you need to know it as tetra here. So let's say them all together from mono all the way to deca, okay? And you should be able to rattle these off. Ready? Mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, deca. You need to know them, and you need to know them that good, okay? Uh, we're going to dig into chapter 8 here today. Today is <clears throat> covalent compounds. And we are going to spend most of the week on chapter 8, probably roll it over into next week as well, um, because there's a lot to cover in this chapter. I believe next week we'll have a lab that ties into this chapter as well about the shapes of molecules. And we're going to start here with just a few preliminary comments about atoms and ions and compounds. Okay, first thing, why do chemical reactions take place? We're leading up. I'm excited about getting into the next chapter. Chapter 9 is where we actually start talking about chemical reactions. But first, we've got to cover this thing about covalent bonds. We've covered ionic bonds in detail. We've learned how, to, how they happen, how they combine, how to name them. And now we're talking about different ways that atoms bond besides ionic. So it always has to do with lower energy states. Things that happen in chemistry react because they reach a lower energy state. Unless you put work into a system, you cannot make something go into a more complex or a higher energy state. So most of the time in chemistry, reactions occur in order to give us more stability, which means lower energy. Okay, we'll talk more about this in future chapters when we talk about energy in chemical reactions. Now, metals and nonmetals we've already talked about. The key to metals and nonmetals was transferring of electrons. Electrons would be given up by cations and received by anions, thereby producing positive and negative charged atoms. We call them ions. Positive and negative ions are attracted to each other by electrostatic force, and they stick together, forming an ionic compound. Now, what we're studying in Chapter 8 is the other way that this happens, and it's not by transferring of electrons, and it's not by ions. This is just a review, okay? We can gain stability a second way by sharing. So here's our sharing word. Sharing of valence electrons, which results also in noble gas configurations. Noble gas are the most stable configurations in all of chemistry. Again, every atom wants to have eight electrons in its outer shell. We can do it one of two ways, either through ions or through sharing, either through transfer or by sharing, either through ionic or through what we call covalence. So you see that come up here in a second. So these are the two main ways in chemistry of forming a bond between atoms. Chapter 8, covalent. Chapter 7, ionic. Sharing of electrons, transferring of electrons. Forming ions, not forming ions. Okay, so covalent. The goal here, again, is always an octet, the octet rule. Eight electrons, valence electrons, stability. Okay, so your products, the things we make in chemistry, are always going to be more stable than our reactants. <coughs> so 
here's the key. Why did we start talking about sharing with today's bellworm? Okay? Because what happens in these atoms is we literally have a situation where the orbitals get so close to each other that we start to have a sharing. Now, um, we were talking about sharing a little bit with the bellwork today. Suppose you wanted to share your lunch with somebody. You said, I got way too much lunch today. I got the, my, my parents packed me this bag. And I got chicken. And I got sandwiches. I got chips. I got gummy bears. I got all kinds of stuff in here. And, and somebody forgot their lunch today. Okay? Now, if you're sitting four tables apart, it's really hard to share with somebody. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Okay, so one of the things that needs to happen if you're going to share with somebody is you have to be in close proximity. You have to be close to them. So if I say, hey, Chase, I want to share something with you. Uh, here, I'm going to share this picture with you on my phone. Check that out. Right there. Pretty cool, huh? But he can't see that because we're way far apart. So if he really wants to see it, if I really want to share something with somebody, i got to be close to him. See? Yeah. So you get close to somebody if you want to share. And you're going to see that's one of the things that has to happen in the atomic world. Atoms get close to each other. They start to get to the point where those orbitals overlap. And they, we start to see that both atoms are going to think they have those electrons. We'll talk about it in a second. So the chemical bond that forms as a result of sharing is called the covalent bond. And the resulting thing that forms is called a molecule. Write that down. So we always use the word molecule only for covalent bonded substances. We never use molecule for ionics. Never. We would not say there's a molecule of salt. Okay? We would say there's a formula unit of salt, but we would never say there's a molecule of salt. Because salt is something that's ionic. And water is something that we know is covalent, or we will know. And something we would say there is a molecule of water. <coughs> we never say there's an ionic um, compound of water or a formula unit of water. So the word molecule is the simplest base unit of a covalently bonded substance. <clears throat> and the bond in between those atoms is called covalent, and it's a result of sharing of electrons. There's that word sharing again. Sharing, sharing, sharing. Okay? In ionic substances, we transfer. Covalent substances, we share. <clears throat> the majority of covalent bonds form between non-metals. And you're going to see this is a repeating thing that we'll need to know. So what we saw in the previous chapter on the periodic table was every time we had ions, it was group a metal and it was a non-metal. It was sodium fluoride, sodium chloride, calcium bromide, calcium iodide, aluminum oxide, aluminum sulfide. We always had a metal and a non-metal in ionic compounds, ionic bonds. Here, what we're going to see, it's always two or more non-metals. What happens when I put carbon and oxygen together? Carbon dioxide. What happens when I put hydrogen and water together? Hydrogen and oxygen together, I get water. What happens when I put carbon and hydrogen and oxygen together? I get sugar and a million other things. Because there's so many different combinations of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. So these are more, two or more non-metals for covalent. Ionic was always a metal plus a non-metal. <coughs> okay, first thing we need to know. I'm not asking you to memorize these officially, but you need to memorize these. Okay? So there are seven molecules, seven elements on the periodic table that always occur as diatomic molecules or diatomic elements. And they are hydrogen, way on the left-hand side. It's the only one on the left-hand side. Then nitrogen, oxygen, and O, right next to each other, group 7 and group 8. Fluorine and chlorine. Iodine and bromine are four halogens at the top. 
<clears throat> These seven are called diatomic elements or diatomic molecules. <coughs> I usually list them in a different order. I don't know why. I, do. I usually go H, N, O, F, C, L, I, uh, C, L, B, R, and I. I just go right across. Look where they are, please, on the periodic table with me. Hydrogen's up here, and then it literally makes the upper left-hand side an L, an upside-down L shape. So it's nitrogen. Oops, where to go? Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Those six elements plus hydrogen always form a diatom or a diatomic two atoms stuck together. So every time I say hydrogen for the rest of the year, you do not write H, you write H2. In its natural form, in the universe, hydrogen is always going to occur like this. The oxygen you're breathing right now is not O. Okay, that's the element on the periodic table, but in nature, it's O2 go to the hospital and read the little tanks that are feeding gases into your great grandma's nose or whatever and it says O2 okay oxygen is always O2 the other half of the air the other 80% of the air that we're breathing right now is not nitrogen it's N2 okay it's nitrogen as a gas which is N2 two nitrogens bonded together by sharing electrons and the same is true with our four halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So you need to know these and not forget it, because this is going to come up probably 100 times before the end of the school year, where we'll be balancing an equation, and it'll say hydrogen. You need to write H2, not H. Or I'll be talking about something, and I'll say bromine, and you have to just automatically think Br2, Br2, because it's going to make a difference once we start doing chemical reactions. Now, why do they form diatomic molecules? I'm going to give you one example over here on the sideboard. Draw this picture, please. So we're going to start with fluorine with our dot diagrams, and we talked about using these more. Fluorine has how many valence electrons, Gabe? Seven. Yeah. And so we would put seven dots around this to represent our valence electrons. This is an electron dot diagram or a Lewis dot diagram like we talked about in previous chapters. Two, four, six, seven. It's missing one electron. So it's going to be very hungry to find that last electron. If it's in a whole bunch of, in the midst of a whole bunch of other fluorines, guess what's going to happen? This fluorine over here is also going to have seven electrons. Now what's interesting about fluorine is it will not form a positive ion. Fluorine can't give away an ion. Remember, its electronegativity is almost 4.0, it's 3.98. It has a huge electronegativity, which means it's not going to give up any electrons. Fluorine will never be a positive ion. It is too small. These seven electrons are so tightly held by the nucleus, which is very close by, okay, because it's one of the smallest atoms, that fluorine will not give up electrons. But instead, what happens is these two fluorines get close enough that what happens is their orbitals, remember our orbitals are, in fluorine's case, one s orbital, which is spherical, then a second s orbital with two more electrons, which is spherical. And then we have the three p orbitals, which are kind of dumbbell shaped. Remember these guys here, okay? And he's got two electrons, two electrons, and one last electron, and one spot open. So what happens is this fluorine is going to get close enough to another fluorine that they start to share. It's going to get an electron overlap. Now, let me move this electron here, and let's do another fluorine right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and waiting for the eighth one. So these two orbitals start to get close enough where he's got an electron, he's got one electron, and they start to share them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. 
And those orbitals, remember, which are three-dimensional spaces where there might be an electron, start to overlap. This little electron over here is sometimes here, sometimes here. This little electron over here is sometimes here, sometimes here. And they're sitting so close at the lunch table that they start grabbing each other's food by accident, if you want to think of sharing that way. Oh, you got potato chips. I'll just help myself to a couple of your potato chips. Oh, you got french fries. I'll just grab a couple of your french fries. And these two people are so close, they're sharing so well, they don't even realize they're eating each other's food. Okay? And that happens in a sharing relationship when you're that close with somebody, right? Anybody ever have little kids in your neighborhood running around? When I was a kid, we had a whole bunch of kids my age, right? We'd play uh, street hockey, we'd, we'd go play baseball out in the field across the street. Uh, in the wintertime, we'd be sliding our sleds down the street. We always played in the street, okay? And there'd be 10, 15 kids out in the street. And I'd come inside, and my mom would look out the window and say, who's that kid over there? I said, oh, he lives up the street, right? I don't know his name. I know he, he's, he's, he's community property. He lives on Seawall Street, right? Uh, nobody really knows where he lives, but he's, he lives here somewhere, okay? And that's kind of like the sharing here. Um, whose electron is this? Is this my electron or your electron? Well, I don't know, it's both of ours, because we're sharing, right? And that's the basis for a covalent bond. That's the basis of sharing electrons, and that's the basis for why these guys always form diatomic molecules. It's the sharing of electrons as these orbitals start to overlap. They are so close together. Again, there's a probability that that electron from this atom is over here in this guy's orbital. There's a probability that this guy's electron is in this guy's space. And since it's in both of their space, they both think they own it. Oh, that's my electron. Oh, that's my electron. Ah, we'll just share it. You can have it half the time and I'll take it the other half the time. Good? So we draw that a number of different ways. <coughs> and we'll see that in a second. So here's the most stable, here's just what I drew on the board. Here is fluorine with its seven electrons and another fluorine plus its seven electrons. They get so close together that we start to have a bond, a sharing bond. It's mutually beneficial for both fluorines to enjoy the stability of thinking they have eight electrons. And literally, when these orbitals overlap, they do have eight electrons. So that's all an orbital is. Remember, there's a probability that there's an electron here. So once these orbitals do get close enough, this guy does have eight electrons. And this guy does have electrons, even eight electrons. Even though there's not enough to go around, they are sharing it 50-50. Sometimes draw it just like this. You see two little red dots. Whoops. Two little red dots there in the middle. Those are the electrons that are being shared. Whoops. Back up one more time. Okay. And so we would call this diatomic fluorine or a fluorine molecule. The word molecule, again, means sharing of electrons exists. Questions so far? Okay. So this sharing thing has to be when these atoms get close enough. They have to have um, missing electrons in their valence shell and they have to be able to meet each other's needs to make eight electrons in the outer shell. Okay, number, there's three different kinds of covalent bonds, single, double, and triple. So the, e, the simplest kind is the kind I just drew here on the side. It's called fluorine, a fluorine molecule. It's a single bond. So we call this um, a single covalent bond is when one pair of electrons is shared. So what happens if I have oxygen? I'm going to jump forward, well, jump, jump overboard here. It goes to this screen here. Let's talk about oxygen. Suppose I have oxygen. How many valence electrons does oxygen have, Aiden? Uh, six. Yeah. So let's draw them in here. He's got one, two, three, four, Five, six. This guy, I'm going to put his face in the other direction. One, two, three, four, five, and six. So oxygen needs two electrons in order to feel stable, in order to be stable. And so what happens in oxygen here is it actually is going to share two pairs of electrons. These are guys are going to get close enough to each other. Let's see if I can do this. Connect them all together into a single 
project. I know how to do it in Word. Take your pointer and draw a paper. Anyways, so these are going to get close enough together that they start to overlap. I'll just redraw it. Um, this electron and this electron are going to start to be shared, these two in the middle. And this electron and this electron are going to start to be shared. So I have two different orbitals, each sharing with each other. So those two, these two, and then I still have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if I draw a picture or a circle around each one of these, this one thinks he has eight electrons. So, oops. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oxygen thinks he has eight electrons. This oxygen, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They're sharing two pairs of electrons now, and that's going to be something called a double bond. Oxygen, we would draw it like this if we were drawing it. Oxygen with two lines in between it is a double bond. Fluorine, which we had before, was just a single bond. We usually use a single line to represent two electrons being shared. Oxygen, two lines would be four electrons being shared. And the third type is going to be similar to what nitrogen does. Let's do that one real quick. Nitrogen forms a triple bond because it has five valence shell electrons. One, two, three. And if you draw these dot diagrams, it becomes obvious what happens. Okay? Nitrogen needs three more electrons, but again, it's not going to form a positive ion. Almost never does. Instead, it's going to share one, two, three. So we're going to have this weird overlap of these these, I'll show you some pictures in, in later in the chapter of how this actually happens. But we end up with three pairs of electrons, which is a total of six electrons being shared. And that's called a triple bond. We redraw it like this, if we were doing the shorthand with it, three lines in between two nitrogens. Or we would write it as a compound, N2. <coughs> Nitrogen is a molecule, has a triple bond, triple covalent bond. It means six electrons are being shared. There is no such thing as a quadruple bond. Don't ever try and draw one. It, it, it can't happen. It's impossible. Okay? As far as I know, it is anyways. So single bonds, very, very common. Double bonds are pretty common, especially in living organisms. Triple bonds, kind of rare, but they do happen in certain cases. Okay, so we have double, I mean triple, double. We can write this obviously as O2 or O. And we can write fluorine, the single bond, as F2 or FF. Okay, so we got single covalent bonds, such as what happens with hydrogen. Hydrogen forms single covalent bonds. Bromine, fluorine, chlorine, and iodine all form only single covalent bonds. You can't do a double bond with your halogens because it's going to have nine electrons in its other shell. It's not going to try and do that. You can't have triple bonds with your with your halogens. It's going to have too many electrons. Eight is the max. The most you'll ever have with your halogens or hydrogen is a single bond. Here's hydrogen has one electron. Hydrogen with one electron. Get them together. They got two electrons in the middle. Yay! Now they feel like helium, right? Same, we could draw exactly the same picture for chlorine, iodine, bromine, or fluorine. It's going to share that one electron just like this. I can substitute chlorine here, the exact same thing will happen. Substitute bromine here, exact same thing will happen. Substitute iodine here, the exact same thing will happen. Okay, uh, just a quick review of Lewis structures. 
we learned how to do these before. Um, so Lewis structures are the dots surrounding a single element. They're useful in this chapter. We're going to use them a lot to show how, whether a single, double, or triple bond forms. Group 16 is the double bond. We talked about this one just a minute ago. Water is formed from one hydrogen and two oxygens. Now, one other thing about group 16. Besides forming O2, which is oxygen with a double bond, it can form oxygen with two single bonds, and that's what water is. Let's look at water's illustration here. So water, oxygen needs two more electrons. If it bonds with two hydrogens, which each bring one electron to the table, then I end up with H2O. That's a double, that's a single bond and a single bond. Two single bonds, each being shared um, with the oxygen. So again, we can draw a picture of that. Find my eraser. Let's go back here for a second. So if I think oxygen with its one, two, three, four, and I can draw it like this. I like drawing water like this one. It's got six electrons. Does it matter which side I put those electrons on? No. There's two that are by themselves and two that are paired up. Here's your hydrogen. He's got his one little electron. Here's hydrogen. He's got his one little electron. And so we kind of share these electrons here and share these electrons here. Going to get it so close together that oxygen thinks he has eight electrons. Okay, remember this one here is from the hydrogen and this one here is from the hydrogen. The hydrogen right next door thinks he has two electrons. So really if we draw a circle around oxygen, you'll see he thinks he has eight electrons because hydrogen is so close in. If I draw a circle around Hydrogen, he thinks he's got two electrons, and he thinks he's got two electrons, so they're happy. Everybody benefits from sharing electrons, and so everybody has a more stable position, therefore H2O is formed, water, H2O, two hydrogens, each sharing one electron with oxygen. Okay, and that's what this shows here. So then we end up with this here. Later in the chapter, we're going to see what kind of shapes these form. Let's talk about group 15, like nitrogen. Not only does nitrogen form a triple bond, but nitrogen forms three single bonds. Ammonia is the classic example, NH3. Okay, Ammonia has three hydrogens and one nitrogen. Why does that form? It's not a metal and a non-metal. It's no giving away of electrons and receiving electrons here. It's simply sharing of electrons. Let's go ahead and draw the same picture we just did for water. So at this time, we're going to do it with ammonia. So ammonia, NH3. Put your nitrogen up here. He's got five. One, two, three, four, five. And what's going to happen is we're going to have a hydrogen one little electron. Yay. And one of them is going to come over here. And one of them is going to come over here. And one of them is going to come over here. And all these little hydrogens are going to say, wow, I found somebody to share an electron with. Yay. Okay. And in this case, I end up with NH3. NH3 can be written in a couple different ways. We can write it as a formula of a molecule. We can write it as structurally like this with the single bonds, NH, NH, NH. Or we can use, draw it using the dot structures, the electron dot diagrams. So I have each hydrogen thinks they have two electrons, two, two, and two. Or I can draw a circle around nitrogen, and nitrogen thinks he's got eight electrons, because everybody's sharing their electrons here. Two, four, six, and eight. Okay. 
bonds. So we have single bonds, double bonds, triple bonds. We have substances in group 16 that can form two single bonds. Substances in group 15 that can form three single bonds. Like ammonia. And the last case we're going to see here is group 14. Now group 14 is carbon and silicon. And this is why the living things, your body, plants and animals are the most complex things in the whole world is because carbon can form four bonds. Carbon does an amazing number of things. So this shows you an example of methane, CH4, carbon with four hydrogens. There is no giving away of electrons or taking. There's no ions formed here. It's simply a sharing of electrons. Let's draw some pictures here and see what kinds of things carbon can form. Number one, let's put our carbon up here and give it four electrons. And before I go anywhere, I'm going to clone that puppy. Hey, where'd you go? Hey, what's up with that? My electron drifted, sorry. If I do this fast, I can clone it. So what's carbon going to do? It can form four single bonds. I have our hydrogen show up. Let's do him in red with his one little electron. And again, if I pick him, make a bunch of him. And those are guys are going to get so close that their orbitals overlap. Shared here, 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 and here. So we end up with CH4 or CH, H, H, H. CH4 methane is one of the simplest organic substances known to man, and we can take carbon and we can make huge long chains of things in your body. There are literally millions of combinations of carbon because it is so versatile. The other thing carbon can do is it can form two double bonds. So if I take an oxygen with his six electrons like you saw just a minute ago over here and another oxygen with his six electrons Here. Again, when these three atoms get close enough together, those orbitals start to overlap. The carbon thinks he owns this pair of electrons and, I did that wrong. and this pair of electrons. And then on this side, carbon thinks he owns this electron and this will work, this electron. So carbon is sharing four electrons, two with this oxygen and two with this oxygen. He now thinks he has eight electrons. He's happy, he's content, he's stable. On this case, oxygen here, he's sharing two electrons with carbon. So he's got two, four, six, eight. This carbon, oxygen, two, four, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight electrons. So everybody's happy. I end up with two double bonds. The way we would draw that is, so we'll move him over here, carbon, this is carbon dioxide by the way, and we would draw it like this, C with a double bond O, and a double bond O like this. When we get to the fourth quarter, we'll spend a whole chapter on organic substances, and we'll see a lot of this type of drawings and stuff like that. For now, we're just knowing about covalent bonds, sharing of electrons. Scroll this down a little bit. Carbon can also do this. One more thing that carbon does is it can form a triple bond like nitrogen with itself. So if I form another carbon over here, we'll 
let's see, this is shared. Two, two electrons, two electrons, and two electrons. It can form a triple bond with itself or with something else and still have one more electron to do something else with. So I can put like a couple hydrogens over here. And so carbon can form a triple bond and a single bond. Notice that every time carbon has to form four bonds. Four single bonds, two double bonds, in this case a triple and a single. And we would have here two electrons for the hydrogen, two electrons for the hydrogen. Carbon thinks he's got two, four, six, eight. This carbon thinks he's got two, four, six, eight. Everybody's happy. This product right here is called C2H2. Commonly called acetylene, which is used in tortures for welding of steel. A-C-E-T-Y-L-E-N-E. -E -E. Its official name is methine. That was awesome. F-I-E-T-H-Y-N-E. And its form is C, triple bond C, H, H. Can carbon also form a double bond and two single bonds? Absolutely. That would be the last combination here. In so carbon. Uh, I wonder if this is going to work. Yeah. And so carbon can form a single bond. Let's throw an H over here. A second H over here. And then it could form something like this with an oxygen. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so carbon has a lot of different things. Single bonds, double electrons, and triple bonds, sometimes on the same molecule. Page 244 tonight. Um, those of you who came in late, I did collect the homework that was due last Friday from Thursday night, so I can check it off my list tonight. Please drop it in the basket on your way out, and have a great day. Thank you, Jonathan.